Good day, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jack Van Horn from the University of Virginia, and I'm proud to welcome you to this edition of our 2021-2022 Foundations of Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series. The lecture series is supported by UVA's Integrated Translational Health Institute of Virginia, the UVA Brain Institute, the College of Arts and Sciences, the School of Data Science, and through a grant from the National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. This year's theme for, the, for our uh, Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series is Ethical Challenges of Artificial Intelligence and Biomedicine, where we enjoy presentations on Friday afternoons from leading thinkers about the promise, opportunities, and hurdles associated with AI applications in the biomedical sciences. Selected participants in our Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program uh, will leverage these presentations as a vital material for our culminating in-person grant project development workshop to be held here in historic Charlottesville, Virginia next June. Applications for the Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab program are being accepted until January 31st, 2022. So please, if you are interested, consider applying and or encourage your junior colleagues to do so. We look forward to reviewing these application materials uh, for your participation. Today, it is my honor and privilege to welcome our speaker, uh, Ms. Johanna Lumba, who's the director of the iThrive Informatics Corps here at the University of Virginia. Johanna Lumba has a degree in symbolic systems, uh, neural systems from Stanford University and a master's degree in systems engineer from engineering, excuse me, from the University of Virginia. She has extensive clinical research experience and previously served as the director of neurosurgery and neuro-oncology clinical research for the University of Virginia. In her role with iThrive, Johanna is the director of iThrive, the iThrive Informatics Corps which is a cross-state team working to accelerate health research by facilitating data transfer and linking and analyzing um, data in a secure environment. In addition to designing systems that support all of the iThrive service lines, Johanna provides personal consultation to health researchers on project design implementation and including plans for data collection, for project management, and for data analytics. In continuing our 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Seminar Series theme, Johanna's lecture today is entitled Introduction to the Use of Structured Medical Records Data. Electronic Medical Records Data, EMR data, uh, is encoded in patient charts through a, the course of clinical care and subsequent patient billing. Excuse me. Coded data in electronic records, such as information stored against standardized codes, provides a vast amount of uh, valuable patient data. Yet the effective applying of data science tools to EMR data requires an understanding of the limitations of those data sets and avoiding common and false assumptions. Johanna is going to address those for us today as she introduces some common data models, cohort exploration tools, and CTSA related resources. She's going to specifically feature examples from the National COVID Cohort Collaborative to demonstrate approaches to structured health data access and analysis. As always, if you are streaming this lecture live, and uh, we are streaming this lecture live and for recording via YouTube, and if you're watching on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Also, our specially selected 2021-2022 Biomedical Data Science Innovation Lab participants are encouraged to submit any questions for Johanna via the chat feature in their Zoom sessions. I will synthesize these questions and ask them on your behalf during the last 10 minutes or so of Johanna's lecture. And with that, thank you so much, Johanna. We've been looking forward to this talk for a year, and we're really glad to have it today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for having me here. So yes, as Jack mentioned, I'm a clinical researcher and a systems engineer, and I currently serve as the director of informatics for the NIH-funded iThrive CTSA. So we are a cross Virginia collaboration. Uh, we work with a lot of public, private, academic, and community partners, and the primary partners are shown here on the screen. Together, we provide clinical care to about 60% of Virginians. And one reason we built this collaboration was to develop systems and processes that would support efficient cross-state observational health research that can accelerate innovation and support evidence-based practice. We also work to support team science by building bridges between data scientists and clinical researchers. And for much of my career, I managed neurosurgery, neuro-oncology trials, and we focused on prospective data collection. But I found that understanding the challenges of quality prospective data collection really does inform the observational research. Biomedical data science research should always include team members who understand that clinical science and the practical clinical workflows that generate the data 
And as you'll hear today, the development of the most powerful coding vocabularies that we have has been really been driven by clinicians. And for those of you here who are clinicians, understanding these topics covered should help you better engage with the analysts who you work with. And my aim is to really just flesh out some foundational concepts so we can establish a strong foundation for your biomedical team science. And so what are we talking about today and why? This medical record harmonization is very relevant to both patient care and research. Uh, the patients benefit from continuity of care across sites, and the government has also recognized that in the last decade or so. Um, in 2009, the High Tech Act motivated implementation of electronic medical records for sites that didn't already have those in place. And in 2016, the 21st Century Cures, uh, Cures Act established um, plans for TEFCA, which will support greater interoperability between those different EMRs. So that's still in the works and the first versions expected out in 2022, which is really exciting. So, you know, patients also, as we know, should benefit from translational research. And once harmonized, our vast stores of this clinical record data can be tapped to solve medical problems. But, you know, through the COVID pandemic, this whole country has come to understand and clinical care are really intertwined and also understand that the ability to pool our data is critical if we want to quickly identify patterns and evaluate interventions and outcomes. We really needed TEFCA two years ago, uh, but luckily researchers have been working for decades to harmonize health record data. And thanks to all the prior groundwork laid, academic institutions were able to work with the NIH to quickly spin up the first massive central repository of row level health data from patients around this country. And although COVID was the catalyst for this unprecedented level of, of cooperation, we've established tools now that are extensible to all kinds of research questions in any and all health domains. So this is really a very exciting time for biomedical research in this country. So this is a summary of what I hope you're going to gain. I'd like you to be able to name commonly used data models, understand some of the challenges and considerations around using the coded data, know about tools and resources to help you, and be aware of some of this work being done by the CTSA community and the NIH to harmonize medical data. Coded medical data, I think Jack provided that summary in the intro. It's really any, any of these facts that we have representative codes in the, in the chart. But it's only the first step towards harmonization is having those codes available. Um, our EMR data is incredibly complex, and I ran counts on the number of EMR codes currently used in the National COVID Cohort Collaborative Database that we're talking about today. At the time when I, I took this snapshot, there were 65 U.S. sites with data on the enclave, there's 67 as of today, it's growing all the time. But of those 65 sites, there's over 75 vocabularies in use. And I've shown them from the most frequently, uh, or the highest counts rather, the highest counts of codes in use. Um, and you know, going down the list here, and I couldn't fit them all on the screen, but there's over 6.5 million unique codes that are represented in the patient charts that are in the enclave right now. So really, really complex encoding of all of this kind of information that we all want to use to answer our questions. So you can note that the highest numbers of codes up in the top, most of the categories for the top represent drugs because we need a lot of different codes to, to uh, identify those. And then that's followed by diagnosis codes. And then you see things for procedures, measurements, and observations, labs, locations, etc. Um, you'll notice that SNOMED appears in multiple categories, so that can be used kind of across these different domains. And even within a single vocabulary, there can be a lot of variation in usage um, between clinical sites. So if you want to uh, explore an example of this, um, LOINC is, is a particularly good example. I provided three articles in the references that describe complexities around the use and evolution of LOINC codes. So how do we analyze data that's expressed in so many different vocabularies, each with its own hierarchical structure? 
Um, I think you all have heard about the FAIR principles and we're going to uh, explore approaches to these principles and we're going to find out that the first two are easier to achieve than the last two, making your data findable and accessible, dumping billions of rows of data out somewhere um, is one thing, but really doing that in a meaningful way where it's interoperable um, across sites or even across clinics at your own institution, um, and then being able to ask questions and come up with uh, answers using code that's reusable is a you know, much bigger challenge. What we need is a common data model, and that is a shared language consisting of both the data elements in one or more vocabularies, uh, living inside of a structure that describes the relationship between those data elements. So the data model is both of those two things put together. You could say that each uh, EMR is in its own way a complex data model. So for example, the 20,000 plus Clarity databases that store EPIC EMR data, plus the EPIC software that defines the relationships between the database elements, together that's a data model. But we have to remember that each site that implements EPIC does some amount of customization. So no two EPIC sites have the same real EMR data model. So typically the more specialized the data, the more it varies between the sites, and we have to restructure our data to really approach harmonization. This typically involves mapping the data that's stored in your thousands and thousands of tables to a small set of about 20 or 40 tables uh, while still trying to retain its meaning. And keep in mind that once you harmonize data, there are still inherent in that patterns, local patterns, reflective of local data management practices, heterogeneous patient populations, and uh, clinical practices. Once the data is harmonized, it does become possible to observe these site level variations in a way that can't be achieved just using a single site. Most academic health centers in the US have mapped their data to one of these common data models. And the map data is used to support any number of analytic tools. So you may not recognize the terms here, you may or may not, um, but you would definitely recognize the tools that you use that sit on top of those. So note that the counts here are a little outdated as I pulled this from a 2019 publication pertaining to the All of Us Research Program. And the count for sites using OMOP is definitely higher now. That is the fastest growing data model and is used for most of the national and international harmonized research. So I just a couple things to point out here because people will, will make statements about one of these being better than the other and just kind of understanding what makes them different. Um, Fundamentally, PCORNET has a traditional relational database that it uses, and the tables represent familiar clinical domains, pretty intuitive with diagnoses and labs and meds, each living in their own table. Where I2B2 uses a star schema model, and so it has one large fact table that has all of those individual observations stacked together, regardless of domain. Um, and then it has different ontology tables that describe the hierarchical relationships between the rows and the fact table. And then OMOP is a hybrid of those two. So it kind of takes the best of both. And we have the domain tables like we do in PCORNET and then an individual concept table that becomes kind of like a data dictionary containing all of the terms and then other uh, concept relationship tables as well. So here are some of the tools that make use of this data. Uh, well, EPIC is actually just taking the, the raw underlying data out of your, uh, your EPIC slicer dice, or rather is taking your local EMR data um, and displaying that uh, through, through a query mechanism. Not all EPIC data is provided in EPIC slicer dicer. It has to be implemented at the site level, um, and it is pretty limited in its interface. Um, and then we have, you know, Leaf and Trinet X as other examples of tools. And these are running off of uh, structured data, I2B2 data or uh, I2B2 or OMOP in the case of Trinet X um, or PCORNET. So, um, you know, do, does this make your data more findable and accessible? At least in aggregate, yes, it does. Um, but do the queries really expose the full complexity of the underlying data? I would say no. 
we've already talked about how the EMRs are different across sites. Uh, and so slicer dicer is really not interoperable. And then, you know, LEAF and Trinidex require that mapping. So we have some harmonization to a CDM, but they're not implemented in the same way by all sites. So for example, Trinetx does not dictate whether ordered inpatient meds that are not actually administered to the patient appear in the data set. And it doesn't provide a flag. So you might have some sites where a whole bunch of things that were ordered and not given are exposed as patient meds, and you might have another site where only the given inpatient meds are exposed. Um, and at UVA, we have a, a data dictionary available to our users that explains that we are selecting just the given inpatient meds and then any ordered outpatient meds. Um, but you know that's that kind of uh, dictionary distinction is not available across sites who are using Trinetx. So we really need to define the structure of our underlying data and harmonize our data to make our queries more interoperable across sites. There's a lot of ways that large medical data sets are shared, and I'm just giving you a few examples here to illustrate a range of approaches with regards to interoperability and, and reuse. And on the high entropy end of the scale, we have those globally scoped data repositories. They accept a wide range of data types and a variety of formats, and they don't really impose a coherent model. And then the federated model, which is used in ACT as an example, um, you can query across sites, but really there's no sharing of the underlying row level data. And so we can't, under, we can't really understand the differences of how that result came about. We just get the aggregate answer coming back from the site. And then we have centralized data where all the row level data is combined prior to cleaning and analysis. And so N3C is the example today, and I will spend some more time talking about that project and the OMOP data that it uses. Um, I've also included in the reference slides a reference to paper I worked on with Emily Pfaff and a bunch of others who um, are working in N3C and it illustrates how centralizing our data in one place has really helped us better understand our differences and bridge those gaps and even enhance our local data mappings and increasing operability and uh, even increasing the quality of the federated queries that we're doing outside of N3C. So now I'll go a little deeper into the OMOP common data model. As I had said before, it does build off of the strengths of the previously developed data models. And it's a partnership between uh, the FDA, NIH, pharma, and academia at this point. And um, it's a mechanism, a nice quote here, a mechanism to standardize the structure, content, and semantics of observational data and to make it possible to write statistical code once that can be reused at every data site. So that's the vision and worldwide we got lots of volunteers working on on this data model. The community that's gathered around it is Odyssey and it's an open science community that builds and also validates tools that that sit on top of this data model and really a rich set of open source tools. Um, so uh, I've given you a link here to this online book about, um, about Odyssey and OMOP. And uh, it's really, really helpful. And you might be particularly interested in chapters four and five for your work. So take a look at that. It's really well organized. Um, and then if you want to learn more about the stuff we've talked about so far, there's a good tutorial uh, from the 2019 Odyssey Symposium that I would recommend. So this is an illustration of the OMOP clinical data model domains. And as again, you can see that we have these kind of uh, domain-based tables, intuitive types of facts in them, each uh, representing person-level data. And the person table itself contains some basic demographics about those people. We have location data. We have derived elements where we look across time at things and see the start and stop of conditions or drugs. And if we, of course, have some standardized metadata about the source facts, then here's all these relational tables, the concept table, which is like a data dictionary, and then um, a lot of things describing the relationships between them. 
So here's a little peek into one entry in the concept table. All of the source concepts are indexed in the concept table along with a mapping to a hierarchical OMOP code. So Odyssey maintains the standard set of codes, typically SNOMED, LOINC, and RX norm. So three or just a few uh, vocabularies are used rather than 75. And they also maintain the, the hierarchical relationships between those codes. And so we have complete mappings from all non-standard codes to a set of standard codes with a much more discrete set of hierarchies that define them. So this is really um, wonderful work that's being done you know, across, across the world that makes this, uh, makes this clinical data model so, so powerful. So OMOP relies heavily on SNOMED CT. Whenever it's possible, it uses it for the standard vocabulary. And this slide is an excerpt from the National Library of Medicine website. So you can go there, they've kind of abbreviated their history here to just pull out a few of the facts. But it does show how SNOMED efforts really originated from work being done by pathologists to standardize the anatomical descriptions. And then the development continued to be driven by clinicians, not like billing practices like some of our other coding systems. So I uh, will note that ICD-11, which is coming out, is much more tightly aligned to SNOMED. So it's starting to converge towards the standard uh, itself. At the 2020 symposium, Odyssey Symposium, Benjamin Biernes and his team presented the poster that shows the power of using the SNOMED CT hierarchy compared to the ICD hierarchy in terms of the completeness and the richness of data captured. And he was looking particularly at computation of the Charleston comorbidity index using the two systems. And SNOMED was the clear winner based on their work. They used some veteran affairs data and they saw higher average CMI scores when they applied SNOMED. So I've kind of replicated this exercise in N3C and found that their findings hold through in this much, much larger data set as well. Um, on this slide, I show counts uh, for total concept sets in just a congestive heart failure concept set created with the two methods. So if you use SNOMED, you can identify one parent code um, and use all of its descendants and map codes. You get 428 source codes included compared to using um, ICD codes where you have the 24 ICD codes that were originally uh, recognized as part of uh, the, this comorbidity in the Charleston Comorbidity Index. And if you take all of its descendants and all of its map codes, you get 231. And you know, a review of those concepts shows that relevance holds up in these, and there are maybe a couple in here that, that might not um, apply. So I provided a few links for you all here so you can explore these hierarchies. There's, uh, these are publicly available tools that sit on top of the OMOP data model and uh, give you kind of a way to look into the guts of it. So Athena is a great one to look at for exploring the vocabs and the hierarchies. And then Atlas is one of those tools, another tool that's created by the Odyssey community. It's open source. You might have an Atlas instance stood up at your particular institution that's sitting on top of your OMOP data, but there are a few public instances also for um, that anyone can log on and use. And this is one where they, they use some large international data sets as the underlying data. So you can get a sense of kind of the frequency of use of different codes um, because it's actually tied to real data and then also be looking at those hierarchical relationships that we saw in Athena. So here's an example. You can go on and you can even search this example. If you go in here, you can, you can mess with it too. You can mess with my example because everyone can, can change each other's <laughs> things in this system. But so this is a, a schemic code, a schemic stroke code set. And I've selected just eight standard codes and their descendants and then any non-standard codes that are mapped to them. And that results in a total of 835 included source concepts. So by grabbing just a few and trusting the work of the community, 
you can grab all of them very quickly or you can go and review all of the included concepts one by one and ensure they really do um, you know, fit your purposes and exclude any that do not. So let's talk a little more about N3C as an example of centralized OMOP data. This partnership was facilitated by NCATS and also CD2H, which is a, a kind of cross CTSA group working on informatics. They provide centralized, secure portal for storage and analysis of patient level clinical data to answer questions related to COVID-19. So there's two um, websites provided here and I encourage you to go and take a look and get involved if you are not already. It's a great learning environment and a lot of um, open meetings and domain teams that you can join and a really easy place to plug in to trying to learn to work with this complex data. Whose data is an N3C? So the intention of this again is to answer questions about COVID. So all of the participating local sites run a query to find the patients who've had a positive COVID test. This actually includes uh, PCR, AG, or even antibody. So at this point, that's that could just indicate vaccine as well, or a COVID diagnosis. And it includes some suspected cases um, from January to May of 2020, when we didn't have the testing and the, and the diagnosis codes available to us. So there's a, you have to have more than one of a number of diagnoses to be included in this group. So it selects all those patients and some of their records that we'll show. Um, and then it also selects two control patients for every, every included patients. And these may or may not have had COVID, but they at least had um, some COVID, at least one COVID test present with a negative result to be included. And then which data is transmitted? It's all of the major medical facts from, from the participating site. Um, as long as it's from been recorded since the beginning of 2018 to now. So we don't have their whole lifetime of chart data. And of course, EMRs kind of vary in, in their length of time that they represent. Um, but everyone has data from 2018 forward and all of those facts are sent. And all of the data from those main OMOP tables comes through. And you don't have to have OMOP to participate. Uh, you actually can uh, have I2B2 or, or PCORnet. If you participate in any of ACT, Trinidex, or PCORnet, you can have your data transferred in from your site. Um, or OMOP, you can send directly your OMOP data in. Um, the data transfer agreements executed. There's a central IRB from Hopkins that we rely on. And um, the ETL is, is performed periodically, typically once a week. For us, it's once a week at our institution um, to send this data. And that's ingested, harmonized. So if you didn't come from an OMOP data model, they take your model and map it onto OMOP, and then you have it available um, based on the approval you get. You have to request use under a data use request, which may or may not require an IRB, depending on the level of data you're trying to access in your own local practices. But the platform helps you manage all that. In addition to the limited data set, there's actually de-identified data, which is not shown here with date shifted, that's date shifted data. And then also synthetic data, which is derived um, and you know syn synthetically recreated from the from the existing data, and provides an even higher level of de-identification. So here's a snapshot from November 11th, and at that time we had 67 sites, 9.2 million patients over 3 million COVID positive patients, over 10 billion rows of data. So really a lot of information. It's a little overwhelming the first time you face it. And I thrive in N3C. We've had a really good time working with, with this community. Um, it's been such an honor and a, a great thing for our own institution to be involved and it continues to be that. Um, so we are involved in the neuro domain team, myself and um, the, the PIs from iThrive and a number of clinicians uh, from UVA, then also from other sites like Emory and um, University of Miami. We all lead a neuro domain team. And if you look on the main website, there's this is our domain team, but there's all kinds of domain teams you can join. Um, it's, it's a really great thing. 
And then we also lead the logic liaison team. And that's just a group of people who we found all of the coders working for the different domain teams and come together, kind of formed a work group where we can focus our efforts and create some generic tools for the community at large. Within a domain team, a logic liaison uh, will help, you know, go from those those billions of rows of data to some discrete variables that can be used in a project. So for example, we saw the ischemic stroke concept set. So we went from hundreds of codes to eight codes to, to one. You can name it, put it together into one concept set. And then out of that, you can use that in a complex variable, like a, you know, if you wanted to do a COVID and stroke variable where you're looking for the first instance of one of those codes and it has to be admitted with an admission and it has to have had a COVID positive test in a specific time period leading up to the stroke. Um, all of that logic can, can produce a single derived variable that can be used to define a cohort or to be used as an independent or a dependent variable in an analysis. And when we do that kind of work, we actually have ways that we can share it back with the community as well so that people are not all recreating the wheel. So in working in N3C, we run into the same kinds of challenges and limitations that we see with, with all coded health data. Um, you know, you really can't lose sight of those nuances when you're creating those kind of derived variables or using them if somebody has produced it for you for use in a statistical or machine learning model. We have to think about how did the code appear in the chart? Again, what was that underlying clinical workflow and when might something be captured or not captured? Um, is this patient report? Is this an official diagnosis? Was it an ordered medication or given medication? Do we know? Do we have to know for the particular question that we're asking? Is it really important to know uh, the distinction there? Um, you know, the start date, the first time that you see a code might not be the time it actually started. Someone could have experienced the condition previously in their medical history, but walked in the door for the first time at your site and had it recorded for the first time there. So you might need to look again at, at coinciding with a number of other codes that it would indicate a real event for the first time, like an admission with a stroke or certain kinds of imaging happening at the same time or drugs. Also remember that medical record data is always inherently incomplete. So you think about all the people flowing through to N3C where they were just seen for a COVID test and they never went back to that medical center. So just because they don't have a complete medical history doesn't mean that they have no comorbidities. So if you just look you know, for the presence of comorbidities and assume everybody else was a negative for that, you're misinterpreting the data. But you can look for some you know, richness in the data and only include patients who have a certain number of, say, visits or facts before an event happened or after an event happened and limit your analysis to those. Working with inpatients is a good way to make sure you're focused on patients who did have some more uh, comprehensive data collected at the medical center. Um, but it really depends on your research question, what's appropriate for you. Um, with all medical record data, we have racial biases in data collection practices, even before it ever comes to us. There could be um, differences in care provided to patients or access to care, and there could be issues with the collection of the race and ethnicity data. We know that it's not always self-reported information. Unfortunately, sometimes it's assumed and recorded by a registrationist, um, and their systems might not always allow for things like multiple race values. So, you know, um, just because something looks simple, you know, we have to still remember that, it, that it, underneath that there's a lot of complexity. Um, and then, of course, medical records from a specific institution never represent a true random sample of the population at that locality. So, you know, we can't look at, say, the rates of, of uh, comorbidities in, in COVID patients in N3C and say that's a rate for the entire country. It's just for those patients and the people who seek care at a medical center, of course, are going to tend to be sicker than the population at large. You're not getting as many of the, the healthy patients or people with fewer um, issues going on. And then also, like we've talked about before, there's variation in clinical practice across sites and even departments and clinicians, and it also changes over time. 
all of our all of our practices change over time the coding practices as well as the things that surround it and COVID is a great example where we know that you know vaccines change things a great deal um, so uh, I think we're all becoming familiar with these concepts and then some diagnosis information might live only in notes and text mining is complex it's not always an option we're working to incorporate more of that into N3C with some text mining done externally in your notes data with some um, kind of aggregated information or derived information flowing through that's in process. So be intentional with how you handle your data heterogeneity, uh, including over time, right? And a lot of observational health data has those different kinds of missingness I talked about a little bit already. Um, so if you create a flag for BMI over 30, a patient might have a zero flag for this feature because all of their reported BMIs were under 30. But they also might get a zero value for this feature if there are no BMI measurements flowing over from their site at all. And uh, ideally, these zero values are handled, you know, differently during data cleaning or filtering or imputation. So look for those patterns of, of missingness in your data. In general, you're going to have a bigger data set. It's, it's messier and it might become more opaque to you. What are those underlying practices? because you're not directly connected with all of the clinical teams producing that data. So be explicit about your assumptions and, and test them when you're working with this kind of data. And for the analysts, we have to think about which type of model should be used. There's definitely a place for both explanatory and predictive modeling. We do usually see more of the explanatory models with clinical data because they're easier to interpret and apply. And then the predictive modeling um, is really less about the why and more about accurate forecasting of what's going to happen. But I liked this quote from Shmuley here that the consequence of neglecting to include predictive modeling and testing alongside explanatory modeling is losing the ability to test the relevance of, ex of existing theories and discover new causal mechanisms. So, you know, it's really the one informs the other and you may uh, need to kind of use the two side by side. So just a few summary data science considerations apply to most work that you're ever going to do even outside of this domain, but make sure the problems represented in the available data that you're actually getting all the facts you need if you're doing something about ventilation of these patients. Do you, really, do you really have all of the ventilator settings and things that might be pertinent to your question, that type of thing? Um, after harmonizing the data, you do have to think about that, that aggregation and make sure you record all of your decisions you're making as you aggregate that data so that it's reproducible by other people, including like the concepts at creation and the logic around it. With training and testing, you might consider with medical record data doing the split um, at using time intervals. So you can look for test your models to see how well do they handle data as it changes over time at a clinical site. And then external validation is always important with uh, this centralized data in N3C. We have an opportunity to do external validation by first training on a number of sites data, training and testing there, and then kind of deploying it out to data um, from other partners who are contributing data and seeing how it performs there. And of course, there's no free lunch. And, you know, at some point, maybe uh, the, the problem that you're looking at at one institution or one set of institutions is essentially really not the same problem at another institution. So even giving them the same model to train on their own data um, might not be appropriate in every case. I wanted to point out these um, nice Odyssey R libraries that are available for your use. There's, again, so much material out there from Odyssey, but it's good to highlight some, some of the really useful stuff. So the feature extraction library uh, pro lets you leverage those SNOMED codes to create those commonly used clinical variables. Take a look at that. It's got good documentation around it. And then there's a whole set of packages for patient level prediction and 
uh, that helps you again extract your data to create variables from OMOP and then develop and validate models for all target and outcome cohort validation or combinations. And it makes use of all kinds of different models, regression and machine learning models, and it also supports custom models that you create. And there are packages included for plotting and, and model performance and things like that on a Shiny app so you can visualize your results. So I, I wanted to talk a little bit, share a little bit of the vision from the NCATS and NIH about use of this data. You know, N3C has provided NIH and the federal government with a successful example of what it's like to centralize data in a secure enclave. And they're now making plans to enhance and generalize this model for use beyond COVID-19. All of this federated work and kind of project by project uh, trying to find the data and transfer between institutions and store it has constituted so much work for people doing research around the country and they're really realizing the, the value add and uh, cost savings by centralizing our data. So for one, they, they plan to provide translation software. Um, the bulk EMR uh, extract, the bulk fire extract from our EMR aligns with the TEFCA requirements that are coming out, the previously mentioned 21st Century Cures Act that supports that exchange of data between EMRs. Bulk fire is really like a language that can speak to your EMR and pull those facts out. And uh, NIH will provide all of us participants with those tools, you know, to, to actually go both ways from fire to one of the data models or use data that you have in one of the data models to communicate with other entities that need to use that data like the CDC or the FDA or you know any of your NIH research teams. And they also want to enhance the secure enclave by supporting project-based spin-off environments. They call it the tenant model. And these would support two or more institutions that are trying to do networked uh, medical record research. And the appropriate data, you know, is what would already all be housed uh, since they would have all the underlying data, but they can make a subset of that available um, on a project sp specific partition in the enclave, along with all of those rich analytic tools that are being developed by the research community at large. This is really exciting and, and will help us all not have to recreate the wheel so many times and build, you know, a, a whole set of tools that we can share and use together. So I have some key takeaways for you. Most of all, we'd like that I like to uh, know your medical coding vocabularies, understand which one you're using or, or several that you're using, and then leverage those community tools like the Odyssey resources that I described to create groups of codes for your derived variables in your data set and use data that is mapped to common data models whenever possible. Apply standard data science good practices, test your assumptions, strive for completeness, consistency, and uniformity, and work with your domain experts to understand data collection and work on variable definition and problem design. It's really a team science problem. Don't recreate the wheel and use those community developed libraries. So in conclusion, I just want to say it's not our software systems alone that require common language. It's our research teams also. We have to become fluent in a common language so that our clinicians, our informaticians and analysts can effectively partner together and do rigorous and reproducible science using this real world data. And I believe that the future of clinical translational research really revolves around bioinformatics and by, work, by working to use and improve the evolving systems around us, we can all help move this field forward. And I think that's all I have. I have some references at the end for you all to take a look at.
Johanna, thank you so much. That was a wonderful overview of the various sources of uh, structured medical records data. Um, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I was impressed where you, on one of your slides, you mentioned 6.5 million unique codes. Uh, that is a staggering number of codes. I'm kind of curious. They, they, how that gets to be 6.5 million unique codes. I presume that you know, somebody makes these up. What happens to the to codes that exist? And like when, are, can they be revised or remapped? Do they get retired or does the list just grow, right? It never gets smaller, it only grows longer as people just add more and more codes. What, what happens in those instances? Yeah, they, they do get retired and remapped. So, you know, there are different groups that manage the different uh, vocabularies, but you're familiar with ICD codes coming out with different versions. And so, you know, the entire uh, version changes and even the hierarchies they use and the codes they use can change entirely. Um, and in a way, the old one is sunset, uh, sunsetted, but you can't forget about it because all this previous <laughs> That's right. was used with those codes, right? And so you have to maintain those mappings from the old ones, right, to the new and, or from all of them to standard codes. The OMOP um, data models being updated all the time. And then, you know, we get, we get the kind of updates ingested into N3C on a regular basis. So it's a big community effort. And there are formats where you can give feedback to, um, to have that, to have the revised, if you you know recognize that there are problems with it, but yeah, it is, it is an issue. It's there's always version control with everything that you do in informatics, so you have to be mindful of that. Yeah, I'm working with some students now who are working with the UNOS um, uh, organ transplant database, and it's a huge. Um, database that covers every medical center in the country. And it's been around long enough that it's gone through several revisions. And there's a whole several places where they're in our discussions with them saying, oh yeah, we don't really use that term anymore. It's really, we use this term or rather they do you know, a number of other things. So you're really uh, overriding all of this is uh, dealing with the evolution of the particular database in question. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that, yeah, you, you have to do two things. You kind of start with relying on work done by the community, especially if you're using able to use OMOP. Um, but then you can backtrack from there and, and say, do I really trust this? And like I was saying, kind of dive into a particular list of codes to see or work with the teams that generated the data for any particular database to find out the true provenance of that. I, I try to go, you know, to, through each each type of code we're using and say, how is this code generated? What are all the circumstances where this code would, would be generated? And, you know, often what you see is that the clinicians who are, you know, conceptualizing the problem, think of a code as used by them and don't necessarily think of all of the broad range of cases where it can be used. Um, so if you have tools like uh, Trinetics at your disposal or LEAF, um, you know, you can take a look at those codes and see other play, other instances where it's used and other, um, you kind of surface these cohorts that maybe a clinician would not have thought about these patient cohorts where, where that kind of code is, is used. So do some exploring, you know, we, uh, every single project we work on, it seems easy at first. <laughs> and <laughs> pass, every pass, you know, it surfaces more questions and of course, you have to pick and choose at some point and decide where are we really adding value. So it's also important, you know, you might have the 6.5 billion um, codes used, but if one only appears three times or something, and you don't want to spend too much time worrying about that particular code, right? So, um, yeah, you, it's important to um, look at use, you know, the rate of use for the underlying facts as well. Yeah, so with 6.5 million unique codes, they, there's probably a frequency at which some of them get used more than others, and it's probably helpful to know about that uh, as you're as you're looking through. I, I I completely agree with your statement that bioinformatics and being able to 
process these, uh, you know, being experienced with this is, is really helpful. Um, and it, one should take the time to be able to, um, you know, educate oneself about which resource they happen to be using. I'm curious though, if, you know, where you have these codes, which is, you know, usually they've been standardized or certainly they've been decided upon by either the developers or the community around them. I'm curious though, are there also um, uh, blocks of free text that are associated with any of these that say maybe um, suitable for natural language processing or um, trying to use uh, information in clinical notes, for example, to then inform which codes one might want to attach to data or draw from data. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Like notes data, imaging data, all kinds of data that's um, not, not so discrete as coded data can be really valuable for any research study. So, you know, we were focused on the coded data today, but um, you could absolutely design and people design NLP algorithms to run on say notes data and then try to map uh, those to the existing codes. So there might be things that could have been coded but weren't coded. Um, or you might just be going for a totally different concept, something that might not ever appear um, in a code typically and create a different kind of a variable out of those things. Um, you know, with harmonization and, and centralization, you get extra hurdles with working with that kind of data. Um, but we are we are tackling those again at the national scale and and kind of solving those problems. It's just really wonderful to see um, what it you know how everybody came with such open open handed uh, good intentions um, in the early pandemic. And I think we all thought we were diving in for a couple months. To get it together. <laughs> Little did we know. <laughs> right, right. But um, but it's so exciting, and it's such an honor for me to work alongside these these experts, you know, whose publications I've read and admired, and and they're just right there, accessible to all of us. You know, you just join any of these public meetings, and you can jump in and and work right alongside them. So um, it's a wonderful community format and. One that um, Melissa Hendel, one of the PIs, I think, calls social anarchy. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's it it really is um, a, a different model and one where that we're trying to get attribution to apply to people doing some of the work that gets hidden and maybe people get credit that that wouldn't always get credit for doing this work. So, folks who are creating these large you know tools that can be used across the community. Um, giving them some recognition as well uh, as these publications come out. Well, one of the things that you mentioned in one of your comments, or one of your slides, you talked about the FAIR principles. And certainly it's something for us who are doing, you know, empirical work um, in patient samples versus controls or we're developing tools, you know, data and software are things that we want to see be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, in what ways are the communities around this, like taking that seriously? Um, how are they opening these up, making the data and the results more reusable by people who are not part of those communities? Does that make sense? Yeah, so, um, you know, Trying to align with open source things as much as possible is very important for, for reproducibility. Um, we are encouraging everyone who's publishing out of N3C, for example, to also publish the concept sets that they used for their creation of their variables because different decisions go, go into that with every group. And you can try to describe those decisions, but uh, having the actual you know, list of codes used to define something like heart failure um, is also critical for trying to reproduce it at your own institution and will save a ton of time for those who are trying to reproduce the work. Um, you know, GitHub is used for a lot of the Odyssey code and, you know, it's widely available there. Um, inside the Enclave, there's kind of a custom interface where we write chunks of code and, and create pipelines inside of there. Not all of that is easily exportable to the outside, at least in a reusable way. You can ex you can pull it out, but it's not really reusable. So um, we're working on, on making that a little bit better. But of course, anyone can join into the in the enclave um, with the data use agreement, and then access any of the code that's been templatized. And um, that's that's really. I mean, sometimes there's so much available out there that the challenge is not can we share it, but how do you find what's meaningful? Yeah. Right? 
what and so we're also working on the documentation processes around that so for the concept sets that we're sharing um, we're uh, asking that people and it's, it's all voluntary but people document the provenance of that you know the aims of creating that particular one um, and the known limitations around that concept set. So you would say, we're trying to be really conservative with this one because we don't want any false positives for these reasons, et cetera, right? And that helps for someone who browses and finds there's 20 different asthma concept sets. They can review the notes and say, well, I'm going to start off with this one because that sounds closest to what I'm aiming to do. Um, and similarly, we're, we're working to create a computable protocol uh, structure where um, a lot of these things like the pointing to underlying concept sets, the descriptions of the logic um, that creates the derived variables um, becomes, you know, extracted and exposed anywhere where it needs to be exposed in any kind of lab notebook type of a thing or um, any database as you're ingesting it, you can see that that data where it came from um, and that can be tied to your protocol and you can kind of point to these bits and pieces and chunks. Um, so that will really help enhance reusability. Um, and my team, the Logic Liaisons, we really work to, to, make, um, to make curated templates with curated underlying variables that are broadly used. So as we watch the community work and we see a lot of people doing something similar but different, we write code and we select concept sets and we create good documentation around that so that people can go to something pretty generic that runs well though that they can take and copy and paste and modify code for their own purposes or just use the output of, of one of these pipelines so yeah the reusability is is always a a combination of the tools to create the metadata and expose the metadata and share share all those artifacts and the curation aspect. And the metadata needs to reflect that curation somehow. One thing that uh, is one of our, our themes this year is in addition to being able to do computing against a resource like this, or perhaps apply artificial intelligence methods and, and such, is um, understanding the sources of bias. Um, that may affect the ethical use of certain data, um, how you know certain factors about our culture or society may get baked into certain resources. And anyway, I'm just kind of curious if in some of these resources, where might the challenges be? And like, for example, in some of these, which are say associated with the uh, medical records um, associated with major medical centers, might there be sort of a bias towards, you know, large urban areas in contrast to maybe more rural areas? Are, are those things to be worried about as one is looking at these resources? Yeah, I mean, I think it again depends on the question that you're asking and some you need to be more sensitive to that type of context than others. Um, we were just today actually working on making it easier to um, access the social determinants of health data like the SDI index or mm -hmm. a variety of other projects like Share, SharePoint and other ones, um, make it a little easier to have those facts tied to the, the patients. And, um, you know, it's possible now, but when you have to go and do a lot of custom coding to get there, um, you know, it might dissuade people from making use of that. And so we're trying to make that easier so people can stratify or use that when they're doing matching. Mm -hmm. um, very, very important that that the data be looked at site by site, no matter what you're doing, again, for completeness of variables um, or, you know, use it, um, you might use it at the site in a mixed effects model to look at the effects of that site. Um, yeah, very, very important. And do people, when they use these, do they need to be, um, do they have to have like city training or some any special training to be able to um, have access to these uh, resources? Yeah, so again, I've been focused on N3C and you do have to have human subjects training and you mm -hmm. do complete the, and that could be your local human subjects training, it has to just be current. Um, and then you have to do an NIH security training, which um, is, is generic training for people who work there. So it's like when you travel with your government laptop, are you being safe with it? Things like that. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, we, we do that um, and review with certain policies and standards, you know, the, the data that comes out has to be aggregated at a minimum cell size of 20. A lot of other database 
data databases people might work with it may be 10 as the threshold, that's a CMS minimum, but that just means you can never make a statement that um, ex exposes a group smaller than 10. You know, even when you look at all the different ways your data converges um, and percentages of bigger numbers and things like that, you don't, you don't want to ever expose a, a very small group of people because that leads to risk of re-identification. Sure. One final question. Uh, one of our uh, listeners is asking, um, uh, along with the um, N3C data and all the codes that it has, and it's what did you say? Did my was this number right? Fifty million records. Is that correct? Um, there's over three million COVID positive patients and about ten million, I think, total or so. I can't remember. The oh my gosh! Well, it's still a staggering Billions, number. Ten, but, ten billion rows of data. Yeah. But, but among among those, in addition to the codes, is there also um, uh, free text associated with with those records as well? The notes data, we are we are working on making that available from all sites. There are a few sites that are doing some early work with that. Nice. And then, but what would be available would not be the raw notes data because that is just, it's too risky, but rather the NLP pipelines would be run on your local data to then extract some, you know, synthesized facts about the notes data. So, well, yeah. Johanna, uh, thank you so very much for summarizing all of these important resources uh, for us. Uh, this is really uh, an exciting uh, collection of resources. We're particularly interested to learn about uh, your work uh, with the, um, the, the COVID consortium and uh, the promise that that has for helping us to kind of get our hands around this and all the codes that, gosh, the staggering amount of codes that we're going to have to get used to. Oh, my goodness. Um, but thank you so much for, for sharing this with us. We really appreciate it. And um, uh, thank you, everyone who is listening with us. Uh, we're going to be taking next week off in honor of the uh, Thanksgiving holiday here in the United States. But uh, with that, everybody have a wonderful weekend. And we'll see you uh, two weeks from now um, at our next uh, biomedical data science in, um, uh, seminar series. Have a great week.